This video is sponsored by Call of War. Warfare in the Pike and Shot era was not about heroes. Battles weren't won by the heroic deeds of individuals. Winning a battle in this time period was all about keeping a tight formation while holding out stoically in the face of an attacking enemy. This required such a high degree of discipline that soldiers needed to be well trained in performing complex movements. Although the training methods differed from army to army, an early modern soldier, generally speaking, would be trained in three important areas. Coordinated movements in formation, the handling of weapons, and lastly, a number of seemingly simple yet vital everyday tasks. Being able to handle a pike or a musket properly was vital to win on the battlefield. But war also demanded for strategic knowledge. If you're interested in the strategy part of war, then check out today's sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game in which you can lead a real country during World War II. The fights involve up to 100 other players in real time, and the games can take weeks to complete. In Call of War, you choose your own strategy. You decide how you engage your forces in battles, and how you want to advance through the game's huge tech tree, featuring over 120 units. Whether you fancy to tank rush your opponents, establish air superiority, or flood the enemy with battalions of infantry, or bombard coastal towns with naval fleets, everything is possible in Call of War. However, you have to be careful, your enemy will not just stand idle. You can declare war on them, or enhance your own strength by forging alliances with other players. These alliances will come in handy for sure, as the game is really about long-term strategy, which for me is one of the most appealing aspects of the game. Also, it's nice that you can play Call of War with just one account on desktop and mobile. Click the link in the description to get an exclusive gift. 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, so don't lose time. Usually, soldiers were trained where they were recruited, on the march to the field camp or when garrisoned. As the military historian Dennis Shaw Walter states, the training differed from army to army, but it was more or less similar throughout early modern Europe. Quite commonly, an unexperienced recruit was paired with a well-seasoned and reliable soldier, whose duty was to mentor the newcomer. This mentor then instructed the new comrade with regards to basic things, such as grooming, handling animals, dress and behavior, in exchange of a share of whatever the recruit might possess, or receive from home. This degree of individual instruction was possible because there only was a manageable number of new recruits at any given time. Many of the men joining a regiment had already served before. Besides these basic tasks of everyday life, the new soldier also had to master his weapon and learn how to move in formation with his comrades. This was achieved by drill. While today we associate military training immediately with drill, only few medieval and early modern fighting men would have ever heard about or indeed experienced it. Training was not uncommon before the early modern period, but in the Middle Ages it was done differently. Knights trained their life long, for example. But men did not learn certain sets of movements and maneuvers in a brief period of time. Military drill was originally used in training up armies in the Roman Empire, when generals relied on the coordinated movement of heavily armed soldiers. But in the early modern period it was the famous Maurice of Nassau, Prince of Orange, who is usually mentioned as having brought drill back to the schedule of soldiers. He was in a predicament. When he was facing the Spanish army, which was widely considered the strongest force at the time, he was pressured to reform the Dutch army. Part of that was that he started training his men in handling weapons and moving together to improve their effectiveness. Reintroducing drill was successful. Maurice's reformed Dutch army fended off the Spanish Empire for, well, the whole 80 years of the 80 years war. Proper drill increased combat effectiveness because soldiers were proficient in handling their weapons and working together. The guns of the time were rather inaccurate, and reloading took considerable time. Firearms could only be deployed effectively if several shots were discharged at once, and the interval between volleys of shots was as short as possible. This was not an easy task. Because of the long reload time, soldiers needed to shoot, march back through the formation and then reload there. 
This so-called countermarch was the standard firing mode, and therefore also the standard drill. The countermarch brought some practical difficulties. Each soldier was carrying a long and heavy musket, a musket fork, and a burning match past his comrades. It wasn't that simple not to block anyone, or worse, to set someone's black powder on fire by accident. Coordinated, quick and safe unit movement, while keeping the formation tight and cohesive, required each soldier to master the handling of his weapon, and each unit to drill their movements and formations diligently. To maximize firepower, formations tended to have more frontage, but this made them even more susceptible to enemy charges which in turn made it more difficult to keep the soldiers' movements coordinated. Drilling and exercising ensured that complex tactics such as the countermarch could be implemented as well as possible. Training had become a means of surviving the battlefield. Different unit types required different forms of training. The training of an individual handgunner or musketeer began with firing drills. For these to work properly, he had to train multiple movements. A Dutch drill manual mentions that this procedure required 42 motions, and the 16th century military writer Humphrey Barwick suggests a minimum training of 60 days for handgunners. First, the soldier had to remove and secure his match, then clean any sparks off his firing pan and prime it with a special fine gunpowder. After tampering the pan with his finger, he recharged his piece with regular gunpowder, a bullet and wedding, which he then tamped with his ramrod. Now he was ready to cock his mechanism, blow his match to life and fix it in the matchlock's jaws. The gun was ready to give fire. Pikemen too were required to train the handling of their weapon. The long unwieldy pike took a lot of group training to be used well. The pikemen had to master several movements and positions to be effective in the close lines of a pike and shot formation. According to Humphrey Barwick, a fortnight of drill was considered sufficient to make a pikeman ready for service, while a crash course could be done in a mere six days. But mastering the movements was not all. They had to be internalized so that they could be performed almost instinctively under the terrifying condition of a pike and shot battle. When then smoke hindered view, the clamor of battle made hearing comrades virtually impossible, and the threat of an ongoing cannonade made one's hands tremble. Drill was not the mindless HOT 234 it is often perceived as nowadays. It was actually a very pragmatic way for soldiers to take their movements to an intuitive level and develop an instinctive working knowledge and ultimately survive under immense pressure. Drill increased the maneuverability of the complex bodies of troops at the time a great deal, especially because it helped standardizing the exact movements and commands. When troops were properly drilled, they could move at speed confidently without breaking up, even over rough terrain. This was crucial to outmaneuver the enemy on the attack, and not to be outmaneuvered while defending. The soldiers knew that they were well advised to keep the formation under all circumstances. From the beginning of his service, every single early modern infantryman had one truth hammered into him. In a firing line, the unskilled or unwilling soldier directly endangered his comrades as well as himself. He could be the first stone tumble tearing his unit into mayhem in a domino effect of panic and confusion. If, for example, a musket fired too early, with the muzzle too close to a comrade's ear, his eardrum could burst. Or if one man flinched and began running, he could very well be the start of a rout. This would invite cavalrymen to charge and could eventually lead to the destruction of an entire battalion. Any recruit who did not understand the practical importance of drill was likely to become the subject of ungentle advice by the old soldiers of his company. All in all, drill turned individual fighters into an organized body of men, moving as one. Usually, the details of drill were left to the non-commissioned officers. They were instructed to deal patiently, if not always gently, with the recruits who showed goodwill so that most men who were obedient and learned quickly enough did not find life in the ranks during training too harsh. 
It was, however, common practice throughout Europe to accompany the instruction and correction of young men by a blow or slap, whenever a point needed to be driven home. This was part of the system and can be compared to push-ups and laps ordered by modern-day drill sergeants. While this was just something to be endured as part of the process, there were serious punishments as well. Usually, a disproportionate amount of it fell to a small number. The dull-witted, the loud-mouthed, or those simply unfortunate enough to be chosen as scapegoats by their superiors or comrades. Sober and well-conducted men often tended to accept the need for strong sanction against the others, whose behavior could do much to make regimental life far worse than it needed to be. The exercise and training of soldiers became increasingly professionalized and standardized throughout the Pike and Shot era, especially with the rise of standing armies. But training and drill was never a major part of soldiers' lives. After the initial training, a recruit spent a good part of his time with the regiment outside the immediate supervision of his officers, either in camp or in civilian accommodations. This provided numerous opportunities to cultivate relationships, from romantic to criminal, and forge his own plans, sometimes even engaging in a part-time job. The life outside the camp and the relations with civilians are, however, a topic for another video. Don't forget to check out Call of War, so you don't miss out on the exclusive gift of 30,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, so click the link in the description or in the pinned comment to get started right now.